Praise the Lord and uh, Shalom everyone. Welcome to class all our um, online students. Warm welcome to also our e-learning students who will be listening to the lecture later on. And also welcome to our uh, uh, in-person students. Morning, Lucy. Okay, we'll begin with a word of prayer. Can I ask one of the online students, anyone to lead us in prayer, please? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this time of study. As, as we commit this time into your hands, Father, we pray that you'll minister to us through your word and we'll be able to retain whatever we learned today, Father, and apply the same in our lives, Father. We also pray, Father, that uh, for a blessing upon all our teachers and all the students of our Bible college, and we ask all of this, Lord Jesus, in thy precious name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Sanjay. So we began looking at chapter seven um, on Tuesday, the purpose of the incarnation. Uh, we basically were look. We're going to look at in this chapter what was what was the purpose of incarnation? Uh, why did Christ have to become a man and take on the fullness of humanity? And what was God doing through? The humanity of Christ that he could not do through any other means. So these are some of the questions that we will be answering in chapter 7. Uh, so we'll be looking again at various scripture passages. We uh, Most of them or some of them in this uh, chapter we've already looked at and studied. So we'll just go through it will just like reiterate everything that we have been uh, learning and um, discussing about. Okay, so the first thing we uh, looked at was Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1 and 2, that in Jesus, you know, um, the, uh, God revealed himself. Jesus was a full, sufficient, uh, perfect revelation of God. You can say that, okay. He is the complete revelation of God. Everything that uh, God wanted to reveal, he revealed through the person of uh, Jesus Christ. So in Jesus, we see um, the Word, okay, becoming flesh, and uh, the Word was God speaking to man. Uh, it was God revealing Himself to man, and it was um, the Word was God, you know, manifesting Himself to man. Okay. So we also looked at. Um, how every act and revelation of God in the Old Testament are completed and fulfilled uh, in the highest and the fullest way in the person and work of Jesus Christ. Okay. Um, the next one we will look at that, you know, as Jesus is the only one who is in the bosom of the Father. Okay. So we're basically answering those questions. What is the purpose of incarnation? Why did... Christ or why did Jesus have to take on the fullness of humanity and what was God doing through the humanity of Christ that he could not do through any other means okay so why did Jesus have to be human why did he have to become human uh, why couldn't God do things through any other way why did he have to become human so we saw that you know through uh, uh, or by Jesus becoming fully human, we were able to, he was able to reveal God to us in a way that we can perceive, we can understand, um, we can experience in a very tangible, in a very real way. It's a reality to um, us. Okay. And now another reason why only Jesus could reveal the Father or why only God had to become man was because, you know, no one has seen. No one has seen God. Yes, no one has seen God. Why Why can't any of us see God? Why can't any of us see God? Because uh, you can't see God and live. Because okay. of his glory. Okay, because of his glory, yes. Because he lives in unapproachable light. He is so uh, holy. Uh, he is so glorious that we cannot see him, and hence we cannot fully understand this great, awesome, mighty, all-powerful, 
uh, God, okay, uh, and we can even in the Old Testament, people could not fully understand who this God is. So it it had to be God Himself becoming man, so that He can reveal the very nature, the very essence, the very being of who God is to us, mankind. And He could do that by only becoming like one of us. Okay, so it was only God who can reveal Himself to us. Okay, and He could reveal it only by becoming like one of us. So He could, uh, you know, when He became fully man, He was able to reveal Himself to us fully so that we will be able to understand the nature of God. We will be able to know his works and know him in a real way for who he is. Okay. Why could why can't we know God otherwise? Of course, he lives in unapproachable light. But what is another reason why we cannot understand or know God in the fullest sense? If Jesus had not revealed him the uh, uh, God uh, to us, the nature of God to us, why wouldn't we as human beings able to know or understand who God is? All of you are still sleepy? <laughs> You're all woken up? Okay. Why? Why did God have to become man to reveal God to us? Any answers, all of you in, in the class, online students? Uh, so that uh, Jesus could represent Father. Okay. Okay. His nature, his very kind heart, how, what he is like manifest himself through Jesus. Okay. But uh, why weren't we able to understand God? In the Old Testament, he did reveal himself, right? He did speak, he, he made himself known, he gave the laws, he gave the rituals, he gave the sacrifices, he told them what to eat, what not to eat, what to wear, you know, how to live. All of those laws were given. But in spite of that, why weren't people able to understand God, even though he revealed himself to numerous prophets, to numerous people, why weren't we able to understand God? Because of our worldly mind, I think we are lost in these worldly things and so we're trying to understand, but because the attraction is more to this world, I think so. Okay. What does scripture say? We are people living in darkness, right? What does it mean that we are people living in darkness? We, we uh, yeah, we are blinded. Our eyes are blinded to the truth. Okay, our spiritual eyes has been blinded. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, why have our, why, yeah, why are our sinful eyes uh, blinded, our spiritual eyes blinded, or why is there darkness? Because Lucy says, because we are sinful people, yes, because we are sinful people, we, um, and like um, Nelson said, you know, we are living in the desires of this world, and also because we are slaves of Satan. You know, scripture was to say, Satan has blinded our eyes against the truth. Okay, and that is why Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Why didn't he just say, I am the life? Why did he have to say, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life? Did you ever think about it? Okay, he's the only way to the Father. Why did he say, I am the truth? Because he knew that people's eyes were blinded to the truth. Okay, they were, their eyes were blinded to the truth. They were because they were slaves of Satan, and S uh, Satan always blinds us to the truth. Okay, even in for when Eve, um, um, uh, you know, when uh, when Satan tempted Eve in the garden, okay, Satan actually blinded her eyes. He spoke the half truth, right? It was not the full truth. And that is what Satan does to us. If you look at our own lives, you know, many of us, you know, are believing the lies of the enemy, right? And so important for us to renew our minds. That is why it is important for us to know the truth in God's word, to, to replace the truth with the lies of the enemy, okay? So there's so many lies. Hey, you're good for nothing. 
you won't measure up to anything nothing will happen in your life it will always be a failure you cannot do anything you can't preach you can't sing you can't play this instrument you will not amount to anything nobody loves you nobody cares for you god is forgotten about you so you know these are the lies of the enemy and that is why jesus says i am the way the truth and the life okay and so scripture paul also is talking to the church at ephesus and he's saying you know uh, we are like people living in darkness we are blinded to the truth okay and jesus is the light who has uh, come to give us the understanding of god okay look at what second corinthians chapter 4 verse 6 says can somebody read that please second corinthians chapter 4 verse 6 second corinthians chapter 4 verse 6 for it is the god who commanded light to shine out of darkness who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of god in the face of jesus christ amen so it said it, it is uh, for it is the god for it is god who commanded light to shine out of darkness okay who has shown in our hearts to give us a light of the knowledge of the glory of god in the face of jesus christ so jesus christ was the light okay who brought us the knowledge and understanding of who god is brought us the understanding and the knowledge of uh, the nature of god the attributes of god and the glory of god so in the incarnation we see that the son of god who is very intimate okay like we read in John chapter 1 verse 18, we've already read this verse um, in lesson 1 and lesson 2. No one has seen, what does John say in John chapter 1 verse 18? When he's talking about the word, the word becoming flesh. He says, no one has seen God at any time. The only begotten son who is in the bosom of the father, he has declared him. Okay, so no one has seen God, but it is Jesus who has become man, has come to reveal God to us. Jesus who is in the bosom of the Father. What does it mean, uh, the word bosom of the Father? The phrase bosom of the Father means what? The closest, yes. Intimate relationship. Yes, thank you, Sister Gertrude. Somebody who is very intimate in their relationship. Okay, with somebody else. So, you know, um, uh, bosom means a child is always in the bosom of the mother, mother, very close to the mother. Okay, so in the same way, Jesus was only one who was closest to the father and he's the only one who could come and, you know, had to become man to reveal God to us. Okay, so... Uh, being in the bosom of the Father, he could reveal, he could declare the Father's glory to us. So there was no one other than Jesus who was qualified to reveal the Father to us. Because no one was intimate with the Father like Jesus was. Not even the angels, not even the cherubims who were very close and guarding, you know, very close to the throne of God. Even they could not become... Uh, you know, uh, a, a man to reveal the nature of God, it was Jesus himself because Jesus ha was one who was very intimate with the Father and there could be no other angelic being uh, because no other angelic being had this honor of being so close or intimate with the uh, Father, okay? So that is another reason why God had to become flesh, okay? Why God had to become man. Are you all with me? Yes. Well, are understanding all very important truths. Okay, so please listen up carefully. I know it's Friday. Friday, all of us are uh, in the in the weekend mode. <laughs> we all seem to go up into the weekend mode, but please be in the class mode now. Come back to class mode. Okay. Um, the next one is <clears throat> another reason why Jesus or God had to become flesh. It was only uh, he who could suffer in the flesh for us. It's only he who could make that perfect sacrifice uh, for us. So look at uh, uh, what uh, 1 Peter chapter 3 verse 18 says. 1 Peter chapter 3 verse 18. Can somebody read that please? For Christ also suffered once for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God 
being put to death in the flesh, but made alive by the Spirit. So here, uh, Peter tells us that Christ was put to death in the in the in the flesh. Okay, which means he was put to death in his human body. Okay, so. If Jesus had to die for our sins, if Jesus had to be that perfect lamb that was sacrificed, he had to have a human body. Okay, So the human body uh, provided a means for Christ to make that sacrifice for us, to die in our place, to be our representatives on the cross. Okay, <clears throat> So what is the reason? Um, why Jesus had to die on the cross for us? What are the reasons why Jesus had to die on the cross for us? Yeah, why, what are the reasons why Jesus had to die on the cross for us? To save us, to give salvation. Okay, to save us, um, to give us salvation, what else? Uh, to yes, we were uh, enemies with God. Now we become friends with God. To build up that relationship with God. What else? To conquer death. Yes, to conquer death. Yes. What was the purpose of Jesus' death? So that we have access to the Father. Yes. Uh, Sanjay says he's he's our only redeemer. No one else could take his place. Yes. Daniel says to, uh, to pay for our sins, yes, uh, to uh, purchase out, to redeem us from slavery of sin and Satan and death. Lucy says for eternal life, yes, thank you. <clears throat> so the purpose of Jesus is that here it says in 1 Peter chapter 3 verse 18, what does Peter say is the purpose of Jesus' is death? To bring us to God, okay, so that we He might bring us to God. So uh, it is through His death that He, you know, reconciled us back to God. He built back that relationship. We are no longer enemies of God. We are now friends with God, and it is through His death that we are also made. The word starts with R. So Jesus is death on the cross. We are made what? The word starts with R. We are made righteous. righteous. Yes, thank you. We are made righteous. What is the meaning of righteous? Right standing with God. What does right standing with God mean? Without sin, yes. Justified righteousness, justified all um, synonyms. We can use it simultaneously. That means God looks at us just as we have never sinned. That means we are declared uh, guilt free. We are declared blameless before God. Okay, isn't that wonderful? That through Christ's death, we are presented before God as someone who is blameless and without guilt free from. Um, guilt and um, he's also presented us holy and blameless without any accusation before God the Father. Okay, isn't that wonderful? Yes. So even through his death, we see that uh, God and man are reconciled to each other. Okay. Can somebody read Second Corinthians five eighteen and nineteen? Can we have some? Or can we hear some voice on the online students, please? Online students can read. Second Corinthians uh, 5 verses 18 and 19. Now all things are of God who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. Verse 19. That is that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them and has committed to us the, wor the word of reconciliation. Amen. Thank you, um, Sanjay. So here we see that, you know, um, God was reconciling the world to himself in Jesus Christ. Okay. Which means God is not holding the sins of people against them because Christ has reconciled us to God, you know, through his death. 
okay which means that man has been brought together with god we are now friends with god once again we read in colossians chapter 1 verses 21 and 22 we see here in colossians 1 21 and 22 that we who were enemies with god now have become friends with god through christ's physical death so can somebody read colossians 1 21 and 22 please and you who once were alienated and enemies in your mind by big works and now he has reconciled in the body of his flesh through death, through death to present you holy and blameless and above reproach in his sight yeah amen thank you just a minute please so the purpose of the incarnation another reason why god had to become man was so that you know there was a physical body you know through which christ could pay for the sins of mankind could experience physical death uh, could take our place and so that we can be reconciled back to god okay uh, let's read hebrews 10 19 and 20 please Hebrews 10, 19 and 20. Therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he conse consecrated for us through the veil, that is his flesh. Okay, so here what is the writer of Hebrews talking about? In Hebrews chapter 10, verses 19 and 20, what is he talking about? We, can, we come can enter the Holy of Holies through the blood of Jesus. Yes, we can enter the Holy of Holies through the blood of Jesus. Okay, thank you. What else is he uh, referring to? Something that happened. The writer of Hebrews is referring to something. He became a substitutionary sacrifice for us. Okay, he became a substitutionary sacrifice for us. Yes. Uh, thank you, brother. He, um, an in-person student said that, you know, uh, the, the incident here that the writer of Hebrews is referring to is when Jesus died on the cross, the curtain of the temple that was, uh, that was separating the Holy of Holies from the holy place, okay, was torn into two, which means we now have access, okay? And why does it say that we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus? Why the writer of Hebrews is talking about the blood of Jesus? Why can't he just say, you know, um, we can enter the holy place through Jesus by a new and living way, open for us to the curtain that is his body? The blood of Jesus was without blemish, okay? In Old Testament, we see there was sacrifice for blood. So Jesus' blood has made the way. Very good. Yes. So um, on the day of atonement, like I told you last class, the priest would have to go into the Holy of Holies. That happens only once a year. And um, I'm sure the priest would be shivering and shuddering because you know, uh, if he has done anything in not the right way, he would fall down there dead. That's why they used to tie a, a rope behind so that if the priest doesn't come out, they would pull his dead body because he would be dead. Okay. So the priest would uh, offer sacrifices. We will look at it in a little bit. Okay. And he would take that blood and he would sprinkle it in on the Ark of the Covenant. Okay. And that's when God would come and appear to man and speak to the high priest. Okay. So it was by the blood of the, the sacrifice that covered the sins of the high priest and covered the sins of the Israelites. And that's when God would come between those two 
cherubims, those, those uh, wings. On the Ark of the Covenant, there was the cover and two cherubims. And in between that was a mercy seat, okay, where he would go, the priest would go and sprinkle the blood. And once the blood was sprinkled and God was pleased with that sacrifice, God would appear and he would speak to um, the high priest, okay. So here it's saying that now we have access to go into the most holy place or we have access to God, not because of our own strength, but it is by the blood of Jesus Christ. And he says that it is his body opened for us through the curtain that is his body, okay. So it is the, the, the body now of Jesus Christ, uh, you know, the sacrifice that he made in our place that we have access before the most holy God, before the most high God, that we can go before his throne uh, to receive mercy and grace in time of need. Okay. So because of the death of Jesus, we have this boldness to go before God in a new and living way. And I hope that, you know, we don't um, underestimate this. We don't take it lightly. We don't, uh, uh, you know, Sometimes we're so casual when we appear, when we go into the presence of God, whether it's church, you know, whether it is even in our personal times when we are praying, um, even in uh, corporate worship times, it's so important for us to know that, you know, we have this access to go before God because of that great sacrifice that Jesus made. So we can't take that very lightly. We can't treat that lightly. We need to value that. We need to respect that we also need to stand in awe and reverence of that so our posture our uh, the way we worship god the, our attitude all is so important because we have this access freely to uh, enter god's presence because of uh, the great sacrifice that jesus did for us okay now uh, let's read uh, another uh, verse first uh, peter chapter 4 verse 1 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 1. Therefore, since Christ suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves also with the same mind, for he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. Amen. So it says here that Christ suffered for us. He suffered for our sins in the flesh. Okay. So he had to be, it was only God who could become Man who can make that full sufficient sacrifice. Why? Why was Jesus alone able to make the full sufficient sacrifice? Why could Jesus not have, God could not have chosen some other prophet like John the Baptist or Elijah or Elisha? Why did only God have to become man to make that full sufficient perfect sacrifice? Because he's the one only who is sinless. He was the one who was sinless only a sinless person can take on the sins of the entire mankind yes sanjay says he was without sin he was a perfect sacrifice so even if you look at the old testament when god tells them to make sacrifice it had to be an unblemished male lamb unblemished male lamb so i was telling you last class that all of the sacrifices all of the rituals that uh, God had ordained in the Old Testament were seen and fulfilled in the work of Jesus Christ. So seen and fulfilled in the uh, sacrifice that Jesus made on the cross. So just like the unblemished lamb was taken, a lamb that was um, not lame or sick or weak or anything, but they had to choose that perfect lamb uh, the same way Jesus was that perfect sinless lamb. Okay, uh, we'll move on. We'll see another reason why Jesus uh, or God had to become human uh, is so that he can bear our sins in his own body. Okay, he who was sinless, who knew no sin, became sin for us. Okay, so there are three scripture passages there. So I'd like um, three of you to read John 1, 29, Hebrews 10, 5 and 6, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 24. John 1, uh, 29, the next day John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. 
Amen. Thank you, Sister Getro. Someone else can read Hebrews 10, 5 and 6, please. Therefore, when he came into the world, he said, Sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but a body you have prepared for me. In burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin, you had no pleasure. Amen. Thank you, Lucy. Uh, anyone else can read First Peter 2, 24? First Peter 2, 24. Who himself bore our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, having died to sins, might live for righteousness, by whose stripes you were healed. Amen. Thank you, Sanjay. So we see through these three scripture passages that in the incarnation, Christ took on a body which had been prepared for him. And look at what John calls Jesus. What does he say in John chapter 1, verse 29? The lamb, the lamb of God. Yes, the Lamb of God takes away the sins of the world. Why does he call Jesus as the Lamb of God? Why doesn't he say, hey, look at the Messiah? They were all looking for the Messiah, right? He could have just said, hey, look, for, hey, look, see, the Messiah is coming. Or, you know, hey, look, uh, the Son of God is coming. Or the Son of Man is coming. Why does he say, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world? Because he would be sacrificed. Okay, because he was, uh, he would be sacrificed. Okay, yes. yes. The lamb, lamb was used for the sacrifice in the old covenant. So he's referring directly to the Lamb of God in the new covenant. Okay, he's referring to Jesus as the Lamb of God. He's saying, hey, you guys are looking for the Messiah, King who will come on a, a horse and, you know, with a sword and will, you know, defeat all your enemies. But actually that is the, not the right picture. Okay, he's just someone here who is the Lamb of God. So when he says Lamb of God, he knew his audience who were the Jews. John is basically writing the Gospel of John uh, to the Jewish audience. Okay, and so they will be able to understand. Hey, Lamb of God means somebody who is going to be sacrificed. And so he's going to be sacrificed for the sins of the world. So this is not really the Messiah in the sense they were looking for. But this is somebody who is, like somebody says, he was without sin, a perfect sacrifice pure, innocent, and uh, gentle. So Jesus, or oh God, had to become flesh so that he can become that. Uh, his body can become that sacrifice. That body can become the Lamb of God that made a full, sufficient, perfect sacrifice. Okay. So why did Jesus, you know, uh, uh, have to become that Lamb that was sacrificed? Was because you know, he's referring to the uh, Day of Atonement, the sacrifice. You know, on the Day of Atonement, there were um, three animals that was taken. One was a bull and two were goats. Okay. Uh, two male goats were taken and one bull was taken. The bull was sacrificed for the sins, covering the sins of the priest. Okay. And the two male goats were used as a sacrifice for the um, the people of Israel. Now, the one male goat was taken and sacrificed. That became the uh, sacrificial lamb. And the other goat became the sin bearer. Okay? The sin bearer or the sin offering. So they used to take one male goat and sacrifice and the blood, the priest would take that blood and the blood of the bull and he would sprinkle it all over in the holy place, enter the holy of holies, and also sprinkle it on the mercy seat on the Ark of the Covenant. Okay, And then what they used to do was the other male goat, they would lay hand on the head of that male goat and would, you know, it was like a resembling that all the sins of the Israelites was on that uh, male goat. And that was a scapegoat called a scapegoat. Uh, which would bear the sins of all the people of Israel, and they would let that uh, goat just go out into the wilderness. Okay, they would just send it out in the desert wilderness to die. So, um, so Jesus was that atoning sacrifice. He made that atoning sacrifice for you and me. He became that lamb who died. Was and that sacrifice was so uh, perfect was without sin, was pure, and uh, hence 
you know, uh, God could reveal himself to man. God, we could relate us, uh, uh, we can, God could relate himself to us and we can relate to um, uh, God as well. And also Jesus bore our sins, the scapegoat. Remember the scapegoat that, you know, the, the sins of the um, the entire Israelites were kept on the, the uh, head of the scapegoat and was sent out into the wilderness. So Jesus even became the sin bearer. So two things, Jesus became the sin bearer and he became the sin offering, referring to the sacrifice that was done on the day of atonement. Okay, He became the sin bearer means he bore all our sins in his body just like that scapegoat and he became that sin offering means he became that goat that was sacrificed for our uh, sins. Okay, And he made that full sufficient perfect sacrifice for our um, sins and for the sins of the entire humanity. So, as we read in um, uh, uh, First Peter chapter two, it says, "Bore our sins in His own body on that tree." Okay, so uh, Jesus made that full, complete, final, sufficient sacrifice for the sins of all humanity, and hence He did away with all the sacrificial system that God had ordained or instituted in the Old Testament. So we, as New Testament believers, as part of the New Covenant, we no longer have to make any sacrifices. No more sacrifices for sins is needed. Aren't you all happy about that? Can you say an amen to that? Please, an amen. Yes. You know, otherwise imagine how many sacrifices, I was just thinking how many sacrifices I would have to make on a weekly basis or a monthly basis, you know, just to cover up my sins. And our church would be a place where there will be full blood and just sacrifices and, you know, animals all over, you know. And if you are a pastor <laughs> and you don't like blood, you know, <laughs> you are going to have a difficult time, okay. But thank God, thank God for the plan of salvation and thank Jesus for being obedient to the will of the Father for making that full sufficient pleasing sacrifice and his sacrifice appeased God and that is why no more sacrifices for sins is needed, okay. Um, and hence he had to, this lamb had to be without blemish. Okay, so only God could become man because only God was sinless. Okay, and so we see that Christ alone could take this position of the sacrificial lamb because he was sinless. He was sinless God who became man and hence incarnation made it possible for a man to be sinless, pure, spotless and become that sacrificial lamb. Okay, so that is why we uh, this point is that he bore our sins in his body he became that sin bearer and the sin offering for us all of you are able to understand any questions so far any questions any doubts okay if not we'll move on okay in his body another reason why uh, incarnation um, took place, why the word became flesh, why did God have to become fully human was so that he could conquer sin in the flesh. Okay, he alone could conquer sin in the flesh. So can please, one of you please read uh, Romans 8 verses 3 and 4 please. For what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh on account of sin. He condemned sin in the flesh that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh but according to the spirit. Okay, amen, thank you. For what the law could not do, okay? So here, um, you know, God did by sending his own son. Which means, does it mean that the law was not good or the law was not perfect or the law could not achieve the reason for which God had instituted it? What is your understanding? We could not live up to the law. Yes, thank you. 
So was the law good? We're talking about the Old Testament law. Here it says, for the law could not do. So was the law good, perfect, right? Yes, no? Yes, only one person is saying, but not very sure. Yes, Lucy says the law was perfect, okay, but we couldn't keep the law. Yes, Sister Gertrude? The law was not perfect. Why do you say that? Because uh, it was too difficult to, for us to keep, I mean, uh, to follow that law. Okay, so if it was, if it is difficult for us that we cannot keep the law, does it mean that the law is not perfect? Uh, okay, the no. law, what Paul says, he goes on to say in Romans, he says, hey, the law is good. Okay, the law is perfect. There's nothing wrong with the law because who's given that law? God. God is good. He's perfect. Okay. But why couldn't we keep the law? Because why couldn't we keep the law? Look at what Romans 8 3 says. We are weak in through our flesh. Okay. Sanjay says Jesus fulfilled the law, which means there was no sacrifice required after Jesus paid the price once for all. Yes. The law is perfect because Jesus says, I have not come to break the law or abolish the law. Yes, I've come to uphold it. And he kept the law, right? So the law is perfect and good. But the law, we could not keep the keep up to the law because we were weak in our flesh. And because we could not keep up to the law, what was happening? We were keep on. We we were we were sinning over and over again. Okay, what else? Why did God give us the law? Why did God give us the law? To set the standard for us. To follow. Okay, set the standard for us to follow so that we know that we are breaking something. We are going against God. We are transgressing against God. We are breaking his heart or we are sinning or doing something wrong. Okay, so the, the sin law actually makes us mindful of sin. That, hey, we are sinful. And when we don't keep the law, what happens? We are punished, right? Okay, so he says, you know, we were not able to keep the law. Uh, what... What was it that the law could not do? The law required us to keep the righteous standards or the demands of God. But the law did not provide us any strength or any help. It did not aid us or strengthen us or help us to keep the law. That is why what does God tell in promise in Ezekiel? What does he promise in Ezekiel? He knew people were not capable to keep the law. What does he promise in Ezekiel? would happen in the new covenant? Anyone? He says, I will remove your heart of stone and I will give you a heart of flesh and I will write my laws upon your heart and my mind and I will put my Holy Spirit in you and my Holy Spirit will cause you to keep the laws and the commands. Isn't that wonderful? Because God knew that, hey, these people are not able to keep the law because the law is not giving them in any spiritual aid, strength and help to keep it. Okay? And they're, they're you know, frequently hence they're frequently breaking the law. So God is saying, hey, these people actually need some help to keep the law. And that is why he says, I will give you the Holy Spirit. And the law I will write on your heart and on your mind it will not just be a torah one book there you know or parchments or on on scrolls but i will write it on your heart and mind so that you would know it and you would keep it so man failed to keep the righteous standards or the requirements of god's law and hence you know what happened because they were not able to keep the law like nelson says sin became dominant in their flesh the spirit was growing weaker and the sinful nature was growing stronger, right? You know, Paul writes and says, there is always a war, Galatians chapter 5, there's a war between the flesh and the 
spirit. You know, there's always a war between the flesh and the spirit. The more you keep feeding your flesh, the more it's rising and more your spirit man is being suppressed. So which is ruling you, your spirit or your flesh? Your flesh. And then you're easily going to fulfill the desires and the needs of the flesh. But if you are feeding your spirit man, if you're listening to the spirit, if you're walking in the spirit, if you're led by the spirit, if you are being... Um, uh, you know, you're listening to the spirit, being trained in the spirit and, and doing the things that the spirit requires you to do. Then what is growing in you? Your spirit, man. And your flesh is being, you know, starved, deprived. So which is going to be more, what nature is being prevalent in you? Your spiritful nature, your spiritual nature is being prevalent. So that is why, you know, uh, 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 God is saying that, hey, you could not keep the, law and because you could not keep the law sin started dominating in you and then he says god sent his son in the likeness of sinful flesh and jesus came in the limitations of being human he took on the physical body okay um, which was for us a body of sin and ungodliness but it was the same body which he took on of human it was sinless and he provided a means for us to walk in the spirit and not to uh, walk according to the dictates of the flesh. Okay. And note two reasons why God sent his son in the likeness of sinful flesh. Okay. Um, the first thing we see that, you know, God sent um, his son in the likeness on, of, of sinful flesh was an account of sin. Okay. So, um, the account of sin, if you read this in the Greek, okay, the Greek translation, basically the account of sin has a sacrificial connotation to it. That means it has a sacrificial meaning uh, uh, to it, a, sac uh, a sacrificial implication or a, a reference or suggestion to it. So if you look at, read the same verse, Romans chapter 8 verse 3, Part B, it says in the New International Version, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh to be a sin offering. So can you see the sacrificial implication or suggestion or connotation here? Uh, the same verse, the same phrase in this verse in the Amplified uh, Bible renders, sending his own son in the guise of sinful flesh as an offering for sin. Okay. So God sent his son in the flesh so that he could be a sin offering, okay? And it's again referring to the sacrifice on the day of atonement, okay? And I've already explained that uh, to you. The second thing um, uh, why, you know, um, uh, God sent his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh, the first one is because of the account of sin so that he can be a sin offering. Um, and the other, second thing is so that he could condemn sin in the flesh, okay? He could condemn sin in the flesh. Condemn sin means what? He could subdue, overcome, deprive sin of its power, okay? Why weren't we able to keep the law? Because sin dominated the flesh. That's what Paul writes in Romans uh, chapter 6, 7, and 8. Very, very important chapters for us to understand the doctrine of salvation very beautifully explained by Paul. You will learn this in the third year. Okay, we'll study the book of Romans. But he says that, you know, um, we were not able to keep the law because sin dominated the flesh. Sin ruled over us. That is why we were not able to keep the law, not because the law was not good, okay? So here, God condemns sin means he subdued, overpowered, deprived sin of his power in the flesh. So why did he do it in the flesh? Was because he wanted to show us as human beings, hey, sin is reigning in your flesh. You are not able to overpower sin, right? You're not able to deprive sin. You're not a, you're always yielding to sin. But here is a man who was human, fully human like us. In all ways, he was limited himself to being human, but he was able to overcome sin in the 
flesh and stay sinless. And when he died on the cross, he also broke the power of sin in the flesh. Okay, So incarnation provided a means for God to break the power of sin in the flesh. Okay, We'll stop here. Anyone has any questions? Any questions? Any doubts? Okay, if there's no questions, doubts, we will end class here. I would like to invite all the ladies who are 20 plus and above in our class. You know, um, uh, if you are living in Bangalore, please join us tomorrow for our women's luncheon. It's happening at St. Joseph's Law College where we meet for Central Church from 1 to 4.30. You're welcome to join us. We're going to be talking on conquering uh, your emotions. So it'll be nice if you could join us. And if you come, please come and meet me so I'll at least see your face and get to know you because I don't see any of your faces here in the classroom. It's nice to get to know you. It's from 1 to 4.30 at uh, St. Joseph's College of Law tomorrow. Okay. Have a good uh, and a blessed and a refreshing weekend, everyone. See you next week. Would it be online? No, no coffee, no. And it's only for ladies. <laughs> oh, I would have wished my wife joins. Oh, okay. No, sorry, it's not online. No, sorry. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah.